Yo. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Markowski, and welcome to my studio. Today, we are going to be recreating another painting by another one of my all time favorite artists. Today, we are going to be looking at the monumental The Rose created by Jay DeFeo. And this is certainly one of the most unique pieces that we've ever explored and uh, probably one of the largest that we've also done and one of the, the artworks in art history that has one of the most unique stories to go along with it as well so we're going to do two versions of this one of which might take a couple of days because we're going to use some materials which are going to take some time to dry so I might there's going to be a kind of a part two to this video that I'll film maybe next week um, but this is what the the image looks like when you're kind of standing a little bit further back from it and then here's a much closer uh, view of it so this is a uh, about 10 by six feet wide tall painting so it's it's a huge thing and it weighs over a ton it's a big heavy <laughs> Um, artwork that uh, you know for many years was hidden be behind a wall at the San Francisco uh, School of Art. Is that the is that San Francisco Art Institute? San Francisco Art Institute, I think. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so we're gonna get right into that. Let's let's uh, kind of start out. Just want to let you know that there's a outline for today's painting it's a, it's fairly straightforward painting but if you want something that already kind of helps solve the problem of how to 
to draw this image. You can download the template and I'm going to show you where you can download it. So if you click in the video description below, you'll see a link to a Dropbox folder. And if you scroll all the way down here, all the way down, we keep on going. We've done tons and tons of paintings by all sorts of different artists from all over the world, all genders. Um, uh, and where are we here? Jay DeFeo. You will see uh, we have three files in this folder. We have the original image, and then we have two versions of the outline. One's a JPEG and one's a PDF. So you can download those. I'm going to transfer it onto the canvas in just a moment. Before we get there, I want to let you know that there's a private Facebook group just for people like yourself. I want you to take a picture of the artwork that you create today, upload it to the Facebook group so that other people can be inspired by the art that you have created. And maybe you've decided you're like, you're just going to watch the, the creation of this painting today, but you're going to work on something else. Take a photograph of that and upload it to the Facebook group. There's lots of people that are working on all sorts of different kinds of things, and it's an awesome community of like-minded people, some of, of whom have just joined over the past week, and some people who have been with me for almost two years now. So, uh, like, here's Heidi. Look at that awesome dog that she painted. Very cool. I love that, Heidi. It looks so great. Right? That's not something that we did in class, but... You know, applying some of the things that you can learn, you can certainly create some really cool stuff. Wow, Paula, great. Lorenzo, we did this Warhol banana about a year ago. And here's Lorenzo's version of the banana. And then a Jean-Michel Basquiat version uh, that he did with Warhol as a banana. So there's lots of cool stuff in there. I really encourage you to join that. Um, maybe just before I also move on to the outlining process, I, I want to let you know that I'm going to be showing a demonstration on how to use this cellu clay material by Activa. You can buy it at Michael's Art Supply. Uh, there's a, I think I put a link to the Amazon uh, page if you want to buy it from Amazon. Amazon, at least when I was checking, was maybe $15 more. Uh, then like it comes in let's see so I got this kind of thing here this big bag and what's a four pound bag 1.8 kilograms um, this is what it, it looks like uh, after you've used some of it and so I'm going to show you how to how to mix that into a material for today's episode so uh, we'll, we'll sh I'm going to sh do that demonstration in about 10 minutes in, in case you're wondering uh, and then lastly so this is the artist we're, we're about to talk about and whose art that we're going to recreate today is inspired from we're going to get into her biography in about 25 minutes if you're keeping track of all of that okay so in the meantime let's download the template i'm going to show you how to transfer it you can do this with any image. You could take a picture from the newspaper and uh, transfer it onto canvas or onto watercolor paper, etc. So essentially I've got here a 9 by 12 sized canvas and I've printed off the template you saw there from the Dropbox folder. Now some, some of these paintings I spend a little bit of time trying to make sure they're relatively straight on the canvas. This one, it doesn't really matter if it's a little bit crooked or not. Uh, really, the main thing is trying to get the, the center point as close to center, which maybe sounds straightforward, but, you know, I suppose some people could have it a little bit off to the side. It's up to you. <laughs> it's up to you how you want to approach today's artwork. So, I'm going to tape this down. And then I've got carbon paper here. And this is a different kind of carbon paper than I've been using for a while because I eventually, finally, after a year and a half, used up all, uh, there was 10 sheets in that previous package because I used those sheets over and over and over and over again. You can, you can use them multiple times. So, 
Um, actually, I usually use a a red pencil so that I can see what lines I've drawn. But since I want to extend right off of here, I'm just going to use a pencil. That way, I'm just going to circle. That's the where I begin. I usually try to do this ahead of time, but today's episode, I did something else ahead of time. So you'll see that that one was much more involved. So, um, I guess another thing I could do is I could just take my, because you could see what's how that's unfolding, right? I could just put this like that, and then use my red, and that way it's, even though there's no paper there, the carbon paper is going to make an impression on the canvas, right? These are the two lines I just did, and you can see how that turns out. Okay, so let's try to get this done as quickly as possible, right? Today is, is a bonus episode, and we're using non-traditional materials, which is one of the reasons why I'm doing this on a Saturday, so that people who are normally just tuning in because they want to learn how to do acrylic painting, um, aren't disappointed. But we will do this, the reason, I'm transferring this onto this canvas right now, because I am going to do a relatively flat painting on canvas or canvas board here and I'm going to do a, a second version that's going to use the cellu clay so it's going to be much more three-dimensional and in an attempt to kind of really recreate Jay DeFeo's original artwork which I think is just absolutely fantastic artwork which again there's there, there are a lot of stories that we can tell about this particular painting. Okay, and then maybe I'm just going to take this tape off from the top, put it down there on the bottom. So that I can move this down here. You always want to make sure you get it on the right way, otherwise you might end up putting a bunch of lines on the back side of the paper and nothing will show up on the canvas. So I've done that a few times throughout the course of my life, so I'm just telling you the stuff that I've done, mistakes that I've made, and hopefully you can learn from them as well. Right, so here's our image. Now you can see it's left a little, I've burnished a little bit because I was resting my hand on there. We're going to paint all over the entire thing anyway, so I'm not too concerned about that. Okay, so I'm going to move my carbon paper out of the way. These you can save, you can recycle them. And let's just move all of our pencils and tape. Maybe I'll need this ruler again. Let me just think about that. Okay, so as I typically do, I'm gonna I'm gonna going to apply a little bit of warm yellow to the surface of this canvas. of people in the chat that's awesome well when I uh, take a, a break here momentarily it will check in there and see what everyone's got to say so where's my water okay now this is just something I do virtually every episode now is put on this warm yellow as a foundational color um, I always I just like the warm glow that it tends to give 
it's entirely possible that in today's painting, really, we're going to be painting kind of thick. So, will any of this show up there? Maybe. Maybe not. But, um, I'd much rather have a little bit of color coming through than just the boring old white of the canvas there. It's also going to help keep that uh, the graphite or carbon charcoal paper, whichever kind of material you've used for transferring from smudging into later colors later on. So let's just quickly create a bit more of a unified surface and then we are done. Okay. So that may or may not get used again. I always just save those kind of things. There's no, if it just sits there and slowly dries, that's okay with me. So I'm gonna let this dry. While that's drying, I'm going to, actually let's, should we talk about, what should we do next? Should we talk about Jay's biography? I think I need to take a sip of tea. <laughs> well, maybe let me show you what I've got prepped here. So in this container, actually there's a few things that I have here. I just wanna let you know. Um, so I've got like this, this tray is just from the dollar store, right? So a dollar tray, it's just something that I'm gonna use so that if I do make a mess, it's gonna be kind of contained within the tray. Now, I'm not sure, this is a kind of a plastic and I think this is silicone in here and it should resist anything sticking to it, but I don't wanna take the chance that I make something and it sticks to the plastic so here is a silicone um, uh, like a placemat here. We got these for our daughter originally, but we haven't really needed to use them. So I haven't, <laughs> I've taken them for my, my artwork. Now inside this container is some of the cellu clay that I made a few hours ago. I probably, I made this about three and a half hours ago, and I'm gonna show you a video on how it was made in a moment, but I'm just gonna show you what it looks like right now. So you can kind of get an idea. So right now it's like a big blob of wet, um, of wet paper mache essentially. So we're gonna, I'm gonna sculpt with this. I'm gonna sculpt Jay DeFeo's rose onto this silicone uh, placemat. It's going to take a while for it to dry because there's a lot of water in here. Once it dries, this same thing, which weighs, how much does that weigh? <sighs> Wish I had a scale down here, but this this weighs probably about as much as a as a laptop. You know, kind of an older laptop. Kind of, it's got some weight to it. Maybe like a carton of milk, a two liter carton of milk, right? Uh, but once it's dry, it's it'll be very light. Like it'll be lighter than a tube of paint like this because essentially, it's it's paper fiber that were like the cellu clay is essentially magazines that have been ground up into um, a pulp, and uh, you'll see here in a moment. So I'm going to play a video in just a second. So I just want to let you know that those are the materials, and then I've got a bunch of different tools for sculpting. So, um, this is, th these are my clay sculpting tools. You know, so if you're sculpting with clay, you've got a, a wire. That's why I've got a couple of these wires. All right, I'm not gonna really need those. 
And I've got a bunch of these, you know, you can just use a popsicle stick. If that's all you have, you can use a spoon or a kitchen knife. They don't have to be anything special. But these are just some kind of tools that you can get at an art supply store. They're, it's, you know, it's basically like a shaped popsicle stick. So I'm going to use those. Um, and then here's also these little pieces of, uh, I don't know what these are, like aluminum or something that are great for sculpting, for taking shaving pieces of clay, or in this case, paper mache off. So I'm gonna be using all of these tools here shortly. So let's just move some of these things out of the way. The other reason why I'm, I'm gonna do all the sculpture on here is that ultimately it's going to go on either, it could go on a, on a canvas board, like the one that we've prepped, right? Or a piece of wood, um, or if you do it, you maybe you don't even need a support. But if I put all of that wet uh, cellu clay or paper mache onto a piece of wood like this, it's probably going to warp because there's the, you know a, a piece of wood or your canvas board. They're like sponges; they're just going to suck up all that moisture. And you know, here's a, an example of a painting we made. This is the Anish Kapoor painting, right? all inside myself. We did this maybe a month ago. And this was a whole bunch of strips of wet um, uh, canvas that we dipped in paint and glue and matte medium. And we put it on here and you could maybe see that it warped pretty wildly, right? And even then I, I had some weights on it to try. So I'm gonna do something different. I'm gonna let it dry on the silicone sheet once it's dry, I'll just peel it off and then I can glue it onto another surface with just regular wood glue or Elmer's glue, like school glue. Okay. So, yeah, let's let's talk about Jay's biography right now because then I'll, I'll, I'm afraid I'll get too far into the the uh, the piece and then I'll we'll be like an hour in. So I, I just want to to introduce this, I'm a huge fan of her art. So, um, Jay DeFeo, born 1929, dies in 1989 at the relative young age of 60 years old and um, of lung cancer. And many people attribute the her use of paint, especially like... Uh, toxic lead white paint as one of the reasons that she got lung cancer inhaling this paint because she's painting with paint but then also carving into the paint and there's all of these you know um pieces of lead white flying around in her studio she's breathing them not wearing a mask uh, now it's it's you can still buy lead white paint but it's you know, very hard to find. You have to special order. Most art supply stores don't carry it anymore because it's a toxic paint. Uh, anyway, what do I want to mention about her upbringing? She was born in New Hampshire, but uh, moves to the San Francisco, the Bay Area um, when she's young. Her father travels around a lot, so they're moving all around California. And she also spends some time with her uh, grandparents in Colorado. Um, she attends uh, uh, UFC Berkeley, which later becomes sort of uh, really important in terms of the the beat movement, which is uh, mostly a a writing, poetry, literature movement. Although there there were a few artists as well as musicians that were a part of this movement. We'll talk about that in a moment. But uh, so she's there. While she's there, she she befriends a whole bunch of, of artists who later become quite well known, especially like Sam Francis. And she's using all sorts of different materials to make her art, often incorporating plaster and non traditional materials into her working process, which is not unusual for the kind of you know forties and fifties uh, at the time that she's in school, because artists are have been kind of questioning what art is for, you know, about 40 years by that point. 
So let's just take a look at some of the art that she was making. These are after she was in school, but it gives you an idea of some of the, the art that she was making right before she, she began the rose. Uh, so obviously these abstract paintings, uh, the jewel, this one I think is at the LA County Museum of Art, and of course the rose, which is at the Whitney Museum of Art now in permanent display. She, she makes mostly paintings during the 50s and 60s. During the 70s, she builds a dark room in her house and sort of dedicates most of the 70s to making photography. And then uh, during the 80s, she gets a little bit back into painting. We see some of her, really just one of her late paintings here. Uh, if you're really interested, there is the J. DeFeo Foundation, her own uh, a website dedicated to her legacy, and there's there's much more information on all of her artworks here. Uh, it looks like San Francisco Museum of Arts having an exhibition of, on her photographs. That's really cool. That, that makes me really excited um, to see that. So the rose, again, this, this painting is on permanent display at the Whitney Museum. Uh, last time I saw it, though, it was displayed like this, as almost like an altar piece, which is really... You know, sort of in this inset um, space in the gallery, in a kind of a semi-darkened room, and at the end of a kind of a, a kind of a hallway when you, you you approach it, and so it has this kind of mystical quality. Whereas here we see it's kind of well lit. I think I prefer the the, the other way that it's been exhibited. Um, what else do I want to mention here about her biography? So her studio, uh, 2322 Fillmore Street, was this large loft space in San Francisco where she worked on the rose from, I think, 1958 to 66. And really, the, 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 the painting was done when she was evicted from her apartment. Um, and they had to to take the painting out the window on a crane and uh, it was you know her her good friend uh, Bruce Connor who was a filmmaker and artist himself documented that whole experience and yeah he basically says that like if they didn't take that painting away from her she would have just kept on working on it for the rest of her life and so they took it to for that she's also she's evicted and then simultaneously kind of some exhibitions pop up because her friends are like what is it what's going to happen with this big painting we've got to do something with her it's going to go in the dump and she's been working on it for you know the past eight years so a, a few museums kind of offer up a possibility of a exhibition so it sort of tours for about a year and then after the painting tours um it ever you know, again, she's like, I don't have, I'm sort of a broke, starving artist. I can't afford to store this painting anywhere. I can't afford to put it into my apartment where I'm living now. So the San Francisco Art Institute here sort of volunteers to have it hung in a boardroom on campus. And it stayed there for a while. And then it was moved into one of the teaching rooms. And because it was... It was so big, pieces were starting to fall off the painting. So they decided at the time to cover, to lay it down flat and to cover it with strips of plaster. And, and uh, well, I mean, I think basically canvas first and then big, like basically, you know, if you break your arm and you wrap it up, that's basically what they did to her painting because they're like, she doesn't have a place for it. We don't really have a place for it. What do we, how do we... You know, like, what are, what are we going to do with this art that people even at the time recognized was an important artwork? So it was it was sort of wrapped in this, like, it was mummified, basically, and then hidden behind this wall. Now, I don't know if I have... I wonder if I could find really quickly... Uh, um, there's a photo of it. There's a video of this. Let me see if there's, we can find a photo real quick. Should have thought of that earlier. Um, 
You can see her, her posing with it. But it is really bizarre. Like, if we see uh, any photos of it in the school behind the wall, the wall kind of goes halfway up in front of, and there's this little bit of the painting sticking up. Um, so the the painting stays there for 25 years and not until six years after she passes away does some curators from the Whitney Museum of Art they're putting together an exhibition on art of the by the beat generation uh, uh, that we're going to look at here in a moment and they decide you know and they're this is this painting is sort of known as like a seminal artwork from that period of time from that group of artists writers musicians whatever happened to that painting people are like oh it's it's stuck behind a wall covered in plaster in an art school in san francisco and so these curators from new york are like really could we is there a way to we could get that out is there could we restore it? what does it look like it's been so they go and they they again there's a video on youtube that shows them disassembling the wall, pulling it out, pulling the plaster off, restoring it. It takes them a while. And by the end, they have the artwork. They've managed to rescue it. And it's a shame that Jay DeFeo never got to see the painting again after it was mummified in uh, the late 1960s. But at least we have it now on display for future generations and this painting is, is is seen as not only a seminal work of the beat generation um and of uh of of bay area art but also seen as as an important moment in feminist art history and feminism in general uh the composition and this kind of monumental artwork Generally, women, especially at at this point, were were making much smaller artworks, whereas men in the 1940s and 50s were like Jackson Pollock, Willem de Kooning, are making these gigantic, you know, 20 foot long paintings that are um, that are you know just very uh, <laughs> what do you call it. Uh, ridiculous like in their size and like oozing masculinity and I think Jay DeFeo is sort of she's using a scale it's not nearly as big as some of those other paintings by by some of those abstract expressionist painters but it certainly uh, has some of the monumental qualities that we associate with some of those paintings by those very hard drinking tough guys from that same generation um, and and I think it, it definitely uh, gave other women permission to do bigger artwork to, to to not just be you know little wallflowers and hide in the corner that women artists could do monumental artwork and and compete with the guys and play the same game as well so I, I have a great deal of respect for her for that alone right okay so there's more I want to talk about but I think what I want to do now is I want to show and there's tons of comments in here um, okay so let's I want to share this video showing how I, I did the the clay here. Um, let me give me one second. Or the cellu clay paper mache. So I'm gonna play this and talk over it while it's happening here. So they just recorded this earlier today, and maybe I'm just gonna lower the volume for right now because essentially what I'm doing here is just showing you some of the materials that were required to make this painting. So, or, or to make the just the, the raw mixture, which I showed about 10 minutes ago. So you can see one of the things that I'm using is just a whole bunch of different bowls. And having, I, I don't end up using more, I just use two of these bowls. But having lots of them around is very helpful. There's a measuring cup and some tape. 
I've got some rags, you can see the Tupperware container that I use, and I've also got a big bucket of water. So having lots of materials ready to use in case you make a mess is really, really helpful. Now you're going to see what I'm going to do here, and the reason I'm doing this outside, and you're going to see little puffs of, of this, this powder kind of emerging from the bag, and although they claim that it is non-toxic and non-carcinogenic, I'm not sure what that has to do with, with the material, that it, uh, you don't really want to be breathing any type of art material anyway. So doing it outside just sort of lessens the likelihood that, that you're going to be inhaling a bunch of this stuff. Um, which again, if you think of Jay DeFeo, she got lung cancer from all of the materials that she was using so um, that's one part of her artwork that we do not want to recreate the, the health issues that resulted so the reason why I was pouring it into this um, Ziploc bag is that it's I just found it's a lot easier to mix in there and w the actual bag itself everything is packed in really tightly right so it's not, uh, you know, if you were to try to unpack it and try to kind of loosen up the bits, because you, you don't want it to clump together, uh, it, it sort of doubles or triples in volume. You can, you can see, look at all the powder all over my clothes. You don't want this all over your house or living room or art studio. Uh, it's, it's, it claims to be 100% biodegradable and non, you know, uh, compostable so you know it's it's supposed to be fine outside and not it's not going to hurt your trees or your garden or plants etc so you can see I'm, i think i put four cups of this powder in here the cellu clay okay i think i'm just going to skip forward a little bit yeah so there's four cups in there and you know, covered now here's my bucket of water and this water is is basically the warmest water I can get with my tap right you could boil water but then you're gonna wait for it to cool down we have pretty hot water that comes right out of our kitchen tap so you want the the, the warmer the water the faster this whole process is. If you're using really cold water, it's just gonna take longer to mix together. The hot water just sort of helps move the whole process along. So you can see I start with one cup of water and then I do a little bit of mixing and then I realize what I should have done before I got my hands too dirty is put in and empty some more of the um, of the cellu clay into another mixing bowl here because what I'm going to do is is get this mixture really really wet or not really really wet but but wet enough you want it to be kind of soaking or over wet as it's called and then you want to add more of the the cellu clay back into the mixture I know it sort of sounds a little bit backwards most people would think of keeping it really really dry and just adding water to it but this material is the exception. You know, it's unlike making uh, dough. You want to start with really, really wet cellu clay, and then you adding dry cellu clay. And you can see here, I'm just breaking it up because the I want I don't really want clumps in here, right? So if the more refined powder it is, the easier it is. And you just have to get your your hands dirty and wet with, with this process. It's I mean, I've seen people try to use forks and stuff and a blender. I think you're just going to ruin your, your kitchen equipment if you do it that way. And um, So you just got to get your hands in there and do some uh, hand mixing. So you can see there, that's a whole second, that's more than maybe almost a cup and a half of water. And I'm going to, I think that's, that might be all the water I put in at this stage. And then, you know, this video is 19 minutes long, and we're going to skip through here because you're going to see, I'm just, 
massaging and massaging and massaging. And then I take some of this dry cellulose clay and then mix it back in again. Now, you can, there's lots of different, I mean, this is a very, very, um, what would you call it? Very, uh, um, adaptable type of material and you can do things with it when it's really wet. You can make your own paper using this mixture if it's really wet. And there's lots of videos on YouTube showing how to make your own paper. In fact, Activia um, has their you know videos on their own website showing how to use this. So, but it's I'm just squeezing it out, trying to get as many lumps out as possible. And I'm just going to keep on going here because really I'm just keep on adding more and more and more. And also some people might find it easier to stand up and use your fist to mix like this. It's probably the easiest to do just standing up. I was just sitting down for um, the purposes of filming. So I'm just going to scroll right through here. Just keep on adding more and more and more. And you'd be surprised at how much of this mixture will just keep on taking more... Um, more and more of that paper fiber so I'm gonna put it in there and then close it up and then just the next few minutes here is just me doing a quick cleanup and I'm not gonna to spend too much time on that but it is important that you clean up before moving on because this material will solidify into like it will turn into like a rock like substance once it's dry and if you're using a, a bowl, you know, it's potentially gonna stick to the inside of your bowl and ruin the bowl. And obviously you've got your hands covered in material. And if you, some people I've seen will mix that, will continue mixing more and more cellulose clay, dry cellulose clay in there for like an hour, right? This is basically just 15 minutes of mixing, but the, I, what I just do is I just take some of the same warm water and just slowly rub it off your hands, right? Um, you can use a cloth to do this, but it's the more your hands sort of soak back in the water, the easier it just falls off. Because if you just start sculpting with it, you're going to have these areas that are going to stick to your hands, going to stick to any hair on your forearms or fingers or knuckles or that kind of stuff and it is like painful to take off so wash your hands before all of that happens and you see me just wiping it off on the bowl and I'm just gonna scroll through here see it cleaning up the bowl and then I'm gonna clean the other bowl Just getting all that cleaned up before you move on it's just gonna feel really great cuz again if you wait till you're all done and you try to do this later it's gonna be sticking to everything and then because it's non-toxic you can just you know compostable or you can just throw it in your garden and let uh, let the plants and the bugs take care of the rest right okay so that is uh, how we make this uh, this material. Deborah says, it sounds like making pastry. There's lots of comments here. So I'll, I'll try to get to some of those comments here uh, while we're doing the painting itself. Um, I think what I'm gonna do, because the, the, uh, this cellulose clay is going to take weeks to dry, or not a week, but it's probably going to take four or five days for it to dry all the way through. There's no sense in me trying to hurry to get it started so that by the end of the episode it dries. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start painting 
the painting and then when I get pretty close to that being done I'm gonna start the sculpture so um, if you're if you just want to tune in for the sculpture go have a sandwich come back <laughs> and join us for the sculpting so uh, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna put some paint on my palette I'm gonna put basically all the paint on my palette and there's I'm gonna probably use most of it in some way or another in the creation of today's painting because while you might look at the original and think well it's just a bunch of gray why, why go to why put all these colors on just get the black and white tubes of paint out and start painting why all of this busy work it's because there's lots of different colors in here. I mean, if you look at that, I see blues, I see purples, I see yellows and oranges, right? And we could just use the black, but as you know, I generally prefer to mix my own black and gray. So, um, put my paint on the palette. And I'm also going to use some heavy gel. So I'm going to use some of this material in lieu of if you don't if you don't want to go the full sculpture route. I'm going to use a little bit of this just to build up a little bit more texture. If you don't have any of this material, you could still make today's painting, no problem. It just won't have the texture. Or you could certainly do it without this, but you're going to use a lot of paint. And paint, especially if you're using it to build up texture, is kind of the, the more expensive way of going about this. Like I think this jar might cost 15 bucks, but you know, you you can imagine you'd have to put about forty dollars worth of paint to get that amount of texture because the great thing with a heavy gel is it basically stays the same dimension as it is when you paint it so like after it dries so if you paint if you put a big glob of this down on the canvas it's gonna look it might lose it might shrink a little bit as the water evaporates but unlike paint, if we put a big glob of this on the canvas, it's going to shrink maybe 50% or more as the water evaporates. Because most of the paint is the water that's in there, right? So, or the linseed oil if it's oil paint. Um... Lolly says, is, uh, is celluclay like paper dust? So it's just like paper mache, yes. In fact, you can make your own version of celluclay. You could grind up paper uh, and then, but the celluclay is not only just the paper, but it's also got like an adhesive in it, which um, basically all you need to do is just add water to it. So it's often used in elementary schools um, because it's, non-toxic very easy to use and relatively easy to clean up <laughs> relatively easy to clean up you know if you start getting it all over your clothes you're kind of out of luck get it all over the floor you're kind of i mean you can you can scrape it and you can scrub it off but it's uh again there's an adhesive in there so it's just gonna you're gonna have to use a lot of that elbow grease to get it off so that's why you want to try to keep a little bit of uh, an eye on where the mess is going Okay, so let's just look at this painting and think about how to proceed with the recreation of it. Um, so, this one, how, what is the best way, if we were just to try to recreate this painting, if we imagine it being a relatively flat surface here, and this is sort of like the illusion of three dimensions. What would we do? That is interesting. I think... 
I think what I am going to do is begin with some white and some yellow perhaps and kind of build outwards so uh, and I might most of the texture in this painting is actually towards the bottom and maybe a little bit up here but really the weight is down here this the center area is actually quite thin so it's where it kind of builds out is where we're going to get some texture so i think the first thing i'm going to do is add some white and maybe a little bit of cool yellow to this so let's take some white cool yellow I'm going to add a bit of matte medium here. Matte medium is basically just clear acrylic paint, right? There's gloss medium. It's the same thing, but just glossy. This is going to dry pearl or, or, or um, like non-glossy. Um, so I'm going to take that and maybe just a little bit of this cool yellow which is because it's gonna give it a little bit of that, some kind of brightness and intensity. The matte medium is gonna make it just a little bit more transparent so we still see some of the pencil lines coming through and the warm color as well, the warm yellow. So I'm just gonna start from the center, brush this outward. And I'll probably end up using a palette knife as well. So we'll just start with this, like that. Um, I'll let that dry. Let's just get as much of that paint off. You know, the cellu clay is an awesome material. You can use it for making molds of things, for making sculptures. I've, I've seen all sorts of kinds of things. Uh, my students use it all at Emily Carr, the university I teach at. My students use it all the time for making um, sculptures that look like clay sculptures, but because in at least in their in some programs they don't have acts like you have to take classes to use the ceramics room and if you haven't taken those classes you're not allowed to just make something out of clay and put it in the kiln because if you don't use it build them properly they explode and dry, destroy everything else in the kiln so you have to take a class to be able to use the ceramics studio so students that don't haven't taken those classes and don't have access to the ceramic studio they often use the cellu clay as a way of making things that look like clay because they, it just you can sculpt it and just let it dry it air dries you don't need it to even to put it into an oven because there's also oven bake clay that you can get in fact this is another I, I bought this because I was thinking maybe of doing today's episode using this type of stuff this is um, this is a clay that will air dry as well and so you can also use this you don't have to put this in the oven I don't think so it kind of dries to like a stone like kind of um, uh, finish but it's 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 kind of ultimately more expensive like I think 
you know, the, the big bag of the Cellu-Clay, you know, this is about half of the bag. I think this was like 40 bucks at Michael's, $40 Canadian, which is like $2 American. Or just kidding, it's, it's like $20, $30 American. And then this is like $17, but basically that's how much clay you're gonna get. With this, with that bag of Cellu-Clay, you would have, for $40, you've, you've got like enough to make a big, like literally a solid block, like that big. Like it, it expands um, quite a lot. So anyway, um, lots of questions. So now I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take, what's the best method to go on to next? Let's get something a little bit darker on the palette. Let's make a, a dark color, a, a, a very, very dark color, and then we'll add white to it to make it a, turn it into a gray. So let's start with our cool blue. And I'm, I'm making a bunch of it because I might use all of it. So if I add, I take my cool blue and then my warm red, and when I mix them together, we get this kind of a purple, but it's a very muted purple, right? Um, because they're almost across the color wheel from one another, these two colors. So they, they lose a lot of their saturation. If we were to mix the warm blue and the cool red together, we would get a very different purple. The purple that we probably expect to get when we mix red and blue together. So we get this color. I'm going to add some cool yellow to it, and that's going to help reduce the saturation even more. Let's get a bit more of that cool yellow. And I put maybe a bit too much cool yellow. Well, it's going a little bit green. So let's just take a bit more red, right? To help balance that back out. And now we've got a really nice gray. And you know what? I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna end up using this and I'm probably gonna have to do actually several more mixtures of this. So I'm just thinking, why am I making such a small batch? Let's just mix this all up. Okay, so now I'm gonna add my heavy gel. Huh, I thought I used, I must have one of these open already somewhere, don't I? Before I, even though I just opened it. So this is the same thing. This is a um, this is heavy gel, but this is the semi gloss. <laughs> I'm just gonna use this since this is starting to dry up inside here anyway. In fact, I'm just gonna mix it right in there. I'm just gonna build up this surface here. And maybe it's, maybe I'm gonna end up having to finish this painting off next week as well. If I'm gonna use all of this texture <laughs> on here. So I think that's 
everything, everything else kind of dried out a bit. Okay. That's the That's my semi-gloss gel. So let's take this. <laughs> That's a lot of gel. Okay. So that's, you know, it was maybe 15% of all of the gel that was in there, right? That's a, a good helping of gel. And I'm going to mix this in. Now, if, if I just leave it like this, it's going to dry clear. And I, even though I'm mixing paint into it, I have a feeling if I just put this on the canvas like this, that it's going to be kind of like a foggy kind of color. It's not going to be maybe as dark as I want. Although if you look at the original, it's it's kind of got this gray quality, but I don't think this is going to look gray when it dries. It's going to look, again, like a bit of a foggy color. So I think what I'm just going to be doing here is building up surface for today. And then I can always paint back over top of it later on. So I'm going to put, wow, this is fun. <laughs> Putting this much gel on here is, is ridiculous. So I'm not going to be worried about getting the color right. Get a little bit of blue into this mixture, that's all right. pretty good. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to basically cover the canvas with this material and then I'm going to start kind of building the shape of it. So as I'm doing this, I'm realizing, you know what? I'm going to lose all my pencil lines. I, th I thought I might. Um, <laughs> oh my goodness. I got to say, like... As, as kind of weird as this looks, it is like super fun. Like just the texture on here. I think what I'm also, I'm gonna do, um, so this is gonna dry clear. Maybe that's enough. You can always add more, but if I add too much, I don't, and I don't think I could really add too much, but let's use the palette knife now. Originally, I was going to do this on Tuesday, and I thought this is going to be so far out that it would probably alienate a bunch of people. So it's like, this is our bonus episode. Let's do it on a non-traditional 
time and day of the week and that way if I go nuts it's so can you where is my center of the canvas right there I'm just going to start with building up some of these radiating lines. Get some of the shape back in here. again sometimes the system crashes a bit so you know one of the things that we see in the original is how the center is is really well refined and then as it gets out it gets sort of crumbly and gross and goopy so that poses a bit of a challenge All right I was originally planning And she worked on this literally almost every day for a decade or eight years or so so um, we're gonna try to do our best to do this in about an hour or less So also, you know, once this dries, you can kind of sculpt it. You could sand it, cut into it. So, oops. So you can see what I'm doing with my palette knife. Maybe I'll get another point of view altogether here is putting the palette knife on a side like this and trying to pull away and so basically as I do that I'm pulling paint off Let's 
So I'm slowly kind of pulling paint away from the center, just naturally, not even really trying to do it, but just because the, the palette knife is just gonna pull paint from the center. Hmm, and I'm, I think my center wants to be here, so we're probably going to do this a few times as we go around this shape. Keep on pulling paint off of the, from the center towards the edges, right? center keeps shifting. That's where I want to be there, right? It's kind of got a bit of a vortex kind of thing going so far, oops. So all that white that I put down there at the beginning, that's kind of gone, obviously. But, you know, maybe when it dries, since this is going to be a little bit transparent, it'll come back again. One can only imagine how many different, how this painting transformed for Jay DeFeo as she painted it. Um, I haven't really seen documentation of how it, I mean, there's some showing how it tr looked over the years. But the very few, I, I wish there was, maybe the Whitney has something in their archives and maybe they've displayed it as part of the exhibition. They had a retrospective of her work in 2013, so maybe that's in the exhibition catalog, but I'm not, not really aware. Okay, I'm just going to go back out here. So you can see I'm kind of... Move, moving around in that center area. So where we want the center to probably be like right here.
getting better you know this is a <laughs> an unusual way of working so it's it's hard to you know I'm trying to it's like trying to master something of that the, which there's no real uh, instruction manual for so So I think I'm just going to keep on going around and around because slowly I'm pulling more and more paint from the center and pulling it out towards the, the edges, which is the whole point, right? But um, let's just look at the original side by side here. So the edges start to get kind of really clumpy and much more rough. So I'm going to build that up a bit right now. And then, yeah, I think just because of the material, just like Jay DeFeo, I'll have to wait a little while for some of this to dry down a bit. And actually just noticed that there was um, just making me think about things that I've thrown out that maybe I could mix that into my paint you know like these types of things from paint tubes. build up this texture here. Actually, while I'm here, I've got 
clumps like that on a lot of these tubes, right? So as an artist, this is what you gotta do. You gotta be creative with your materials. I mean, I could just use more and more um, uh, pieces, or more and more of my heavy matte gel. But since I just take these things and throw them into the garbage anyway, why not use them for something? I knew that there was... Every time I throw those things in the garbage, I've been thinking to myself, there's got to be a use for these things. Like, man, thinking... <laughs> It now it makes me think of all of those pieces that I've thrown in the garbage over the years. How I, right now, I could actually use them. So. going to take the heavy gel out of the tube and just putting some of it back over top to kind of integrate it, hide it, and also hopefully to help glue it into the surface here. It's just one of those episodes where you gotta get dirty. And just seeing the texture starting to build up like this is just it makes me so excited. Told you this is going to be something a little bit different, right? Okay. Now. Just 
just want to go back here, I think, one last time. Clean this up. I mean, I think I could do a lot more of this type of a thing. I'll just kind of keep on going at this forever, but because there's areas I think I could want, kind of want to build more texture to. In fact, since I got all of this paint that I don't foresee using, let's just put it in here. So this is just the acrylic out of the tube here without any extra gel in it. So I imagine it's going to get a little bit thinner as it dries. It won't keep the, the, um, the same texture that the, the heavy gel will. But you know, I bet you inside of Jay DeFeo's painting there are there's lots more colors than the final color that we see. So kind of using what the available paint that we have. sense to me in terms of her concept and her approach. You know, I mean, I like, I really actually like the way that looks. It does make me kind of want to think about doing more of that, but I think what I'll rather than just wasting a bunch of paint to building up these surfaces, I'll I'll do that when I do the the part two to this particular painting.
Okay. I think that's just about done. So let's put this one aside, I think, because I, I, you know, I could be convinced to just to leave this painting like that, um, especially the colors as they mix. But I think I can do that same thing again, but in a little bit more of a controlled way, more thoughtful way when I finish the painting. So, you know, just looking at these two side by side. You know, when this is all dry, I'll go back in and paint white in here, and then we'll darken it towards the edges. Some of this yellow, which is working right now, again, I don't mind it, but I think it's just a little bit um, quite different than the original. Okay. So I'm going to set this aside, and I want to set it. There's a, there is quite a lot of material on here, so I want to set it on somewhere nice and flat so that it's not... If I put it, let's say, on a cup like this, and I leave it, let it dry overnight, what's going to happen is the canvas is going to start to to bend. Same sort of thing. If I was to put them like that to dry, when I come back in the morning, it's probably going to have sagged because the canvas and the board inside the canvas are soaking the moisture out of the paint. There's yes, there's moisture evaporating into the air but there's also moisture that's being sucked down into the support. And so you really want to leave it on a flat surface to dry. Okay. So. This one. Um, well, let's see. I'm going to put it right here. Yeah. Bring it back out. We're just about done. Okay. And maybe I don't think I'm going to be doing any more painting today, so I'm just going to take this off and put this in the sink to to start soaking. Because otherwise, I always find mediums they uh, when they get when they dry, they can be really hard to get off surfaces, especially like pouring medium I find that one once it's dry it is like it it's like a glue it really binds very solidly so I'm gonna put this in the sink okay There's so many, so many comments here. I just see the last one at the end here. Heidi says, uh, Hi, Michael. Um, this could be an engaging project with kids. Is Edie watching? Edie's having her nap right now. That's generally why the episodes happen when they do, is because that's when my daughter is asleep, so that uh, uh, I can get a bunch of work done <laughs> while she's uh, occupied. So, here is this cellu clay mixture that I made earlier, right? And it is 
kind of, it's pretty gooey. Um, it, it feels like what you would imagine paper feels like after it's gotten really, really, really wet. So maybe before I launch into this, it's just worth kind of thinking about the size of this material that I want to ultimately create. So I'm just like, this is a nine by 12 sized board. I might make it just a little bit bigger. That way I can always trim some of it off if I, uh, if I want to. Because the cellu clay, you know, it's going to turn into like a very rigid shape. And you can, you can saw it, you can sand it, you can chisel into it. Uh, lots of different artists. It's so versatile. That's the word I was trying to think of a while ago. Versatile. So you can see I'm just expanding a little bit beyond the the size of the ultimate, the canvas that it'll be. And I just want to double check that that's the right size. Yeah, that I'm using the same size canvas. Okay. So. Uh, the other thing, you know, I've seen people do this and, you know, I made this about now about four hours ago. I've seen people put it in the refrigerator and let it dry in the refrigerator or, be, or so if you keep it in a Tupperware container or you've got a piece of cellophane um, saran wrap over top of it, it it's, doesn't allow it to dry so much as what's happening is the moisture that's inside is moving throughout the entire shape and especially any little clumps of the cellu clay that uh, that were dry they're you know like dry kind of parts the water is sort of just seeping through every part of it and getting to those more clumpy areas so really what i'm doing just right now and you know I guess with this particular painting, I don't really have to to worry about it being really. I don't. In fact, some of the clumps are right there in the original painting, right? So, uh, in some ways, having a clumpy mixture works well. But if you wanted to use this to create something else you want to get maybe a really smooth surface and you could make there's I mean as I said tons of different things like basically I wouldn't worry too much about getting the smoothest surface I'd wait for it to dry and then you can use sandpaper to really get a better um, finish surface to it So, um, I guess let's just spread this all out. I mean, just the sound of this. <laughs> I don't know if that comes across on the microphone, but it is wonderfully gooey. Oh my goodness. Definitely, if you were in a room full of little kids, there would be lots of laughter right now.
Now, I mean, something like this literally would take probably a week to dry. I mean, just because there's water trapped inside, we could hit it with a, um, you know, a, a hair dryer. But the thing is, is it might dry the outside of it, but the underside is there's still going to be water trapped inside, right? So you might have like a dry skin, but some of the stuff in the very middle is going to take much longer to dry. So. I was thinking about, I was, my original plan was I was going to keep some of this and make a sculpture afterwards, but I might just end up using the rest of it. You know, if you continue, like I could take more of the celluclay and mix it into this, and the more you do that, the drier it becomes, and the more refined kind of sculpting you can do with it. People sculpt faces, all that kind of stuff with it. I'm not going to do that. Let's just think this is our middle. In fact, let's uh, get the original up here so I have some idea what I'm doing, right? Okay, so currently, the majority of the, it's it's very even. Whereas really this is gonna, we need to kind of dip that down and we want more of this material out towards the bottom and the edges. I want it too thin. So the same sort of thing we were doing with the palette knife with the paint. Kind of these little triangular shaped things. The difference is that the paint um, kind of nicely pulled towards the edges. This paper mache is not behaving in the same way, right? Which is not surprising. It's possible that as this dries, see I've, hmm. I'm noticing this tray seems to kind of be bubbling up. What if I took the tray from out underneath here. Now, it's okay if these pieces separate. I'm just gonna glue them down. But the thing is, if it's really thin, my concern is as they dry, these could peel up and out. And I could end up having like an empty place and all of these kind of like little um, downhill skis or something end up forming. Let's 
So that's just something I'll watch for. If you've never used cellu clay before, one of the reasons I chose this project is to use this material is unlike if we were trying to make a sculpture of a face or something, this is, you know, the stakes are pretty low, right? The, the, the composition of this painting is, um, is not overly complex. So it sort of gives people permission to kind of have a little bit of fun, not worry so much about making it absolutely perfect. I'm just trimming off some of this excess from some of the sides to build up the texture on the, the bottom, which is where most of the weight is. done a pretty good job on the what will ulti ultimately be the bottom now this is the top side of the picture so if I was to think of it this way I can already feel the the consistency changing and becoming more and more stiff and less um, manipulatable, malleable. You can use um, like a little bit of a, a spray to, of just water, like a hairspray container just to mist it to kind of keep it wet. But uh, I think at the pace that I'm working at right now, I won't need it. I mean, I do have... You know, a cup of water if I wanted to sort of take a little bit and just drip on the surface that's going to be do more than enough I think you know the the more wet it is the the more it's going to the less it's going to hold the shape as it starts to dry out it's a lot easier to um 
to shape it because it becomes more like a clay, right? And as you know, I mentioned earlier, you can make your own version of Cellucle. You don't have to buy the brand name. It is, but it does save a lot of time. Like if you were to try to, I, I remember doing this. When did I? In, I did have a class. I remember we did pulp, made it, made our own pulp. God, that would have been a long time ago. I'm trying. I can't remember. When did I do that? So I think one thing I might do is just leave the center not quite completely refined here. And then after it's dry, I can use like a, a chisel or in sandpaper, a knife to kind of gouge in here. Because at some point, like doing this kind of thing with, with a tool is is just more it's just going to be kind of frustrating because I'm not going to be able to to um cuz I'm I'm risking it's very thin here and I'm already I'm I am worried that that might be a little bit too thin as it is so I'm just going to keep that on my radar for So let's just think about Trying to get some of these textures in here. Like I like how it kind of lumped up down here. So I'm just trying to think of like how can I sort of fake that. Can you imagine these being giant globs of oil paint? <laughs> I mean, it's like, holy smokes, there must be tens of thousands of dollars worth of oil paint in that, uh, in her original painting here.
So obviously this is, you know, something I would not be able to do with my... Well, I guess if I want if I wanted to spend hundreds of dollars in acrylic paint, I could probably do something like this. And are using lots of that heavy gel. I think this is sort of like a matter of just pulling, you know, digging in, smoothing, digging, smoothing. Another way might have been to take little bits of, of clay or the cellu clay and kind of just almost like lump it into like triangular pieces. Um, now that I'm sort of working here, I could like, okay, that would have probably also worked, but. Towards the top here, we get a bit more of like a, um, almost like little balls and stuff. Like, it makes me think of just chewing this surface up a lot. Less kind of smooth. This up here, I just want kind of like a real, almost like rocks and pebbles. When I look at that top, I think of like the shoreline and the kind of little pebbles in the water and interesting as it dries out it's becoming it's behaving a little bit more like the paint allowing me to shape it a little bit more could see someone doing a cake version of this that would be pretty cool can you imagine that would be for your your art friend who's having a birthday they might not even know what it is they'd be like oh this is interesting did it fall on the floor while you were like why does it have this weird texture like you don't know who jay defeo is look it up on your phone and everyone's like, oh, wow, actually, it looks really good. Sorry.
Hmm, I noticed that, you know, I'm gonna take s a little bit of this off the top up here. And I'm gonna keep building down below. You know, I look at it and I see all, like the original, I see all of these, like, it's, it's, I've kind of almost oversimplified the, sh the whole shape. It's, it's quite complicated. And especially when we get up here towards the top, there's, you know, the, the radiating part sort of kind of ends, stops, right? Get a bit of that in here. So again, I'm just chewing up the surface up here. starting to get f the feeling I might be pretty close to being done. It's not uh, going to be exactly like the original. None of these paintings really ever are anyway, right? And so I'm, I've never made something <laughs> quite like this before. So I'm super curious to see how when it dries how it will ultimately kind of look. Uh, do I want to do any more? I think, again, I'm, once it dries, it, I'll be able to sand and chisel some of this. I even think I probably am a little bit thin in the middle. You know, um, to the point where I think I'm going to put a little bit of this clay back into the in here.
some of that area where it's just so thin. I'm worried that uh, it's going to really uh, bulge and warp and do all sorts of weird things. If the, if the thicker it is, the more I'm convinced it's going to dry a little bit more evenly. Okay, it's making me feel better that if I want to do that, that the center area will dry a little bit better and then I can just chisel that out, you know, just using a screwdriver if you don't have, or, you know, like a box cutter or knife might, might do the trick as well. Some of this here is kind of thick. I mean, when I you get the shadows over it, it does start to really kind of feel like it comes together quite a lot more. Okay, so I'm gonna let this dry. Now, I'm just gonna show just a quick, uh, a little bit about my, how I'm gonna clean up here, and then so then I'll sign off. Um, some water now I don't want to be putting this down the sink right so any of these tools that I'm going to use I'm going to clean off in this bucket and then I'm going to dump it out in the garden afterwards so that I don't uh, I think that's okay it does bulge up a little bit in the middle but that's something I can live with um, how might do I make that stay down there I'm gonna clean my hands and then I'll sort that out Got a bucket of water. Now this water was the same water I used earlier, so it's not as warm. But I can just soak my fingers in here for just a couple of seconds, and all of that starts to the material starts to kind of come off. 
It's so much easier doing this than picking at your fingers and literally tearing the skin. And um, if you just put your fingers in some water, the, it just starts to kind of come right off. If you're, you can also just use a rag. In this case, it's just a, a, a piece that I of an old T-shirt that I've torn that I use as rags for my painting, and it just helps to get things off, right? I've never... I don't know if you can use latex gloves for this type of thing. I'm not sure. You might find that the gloves just start sticking and it becomes a bit of a pain. Um, I'm not sure if that would work. <laughs> it does look like I made some pizza there. People talking about you know, this image looking a bit like a pizza. Putting pizza dough down there, rolling it out. Um, this is a really cool material. And in, in many ways, I'm using it in the least spectacular way possible for this particular artwork. You know, rather than building up with paint. But this is, you know, I'm always thinking, like, what is the, the simplest way of introducing a material where the results are very easy to achieve? You know, rather than trying to, to create a portrait or something with this material, building a dragon or something. Um, people make masks, like costumes for you know to dress up for Halloween with cellu clay some people make really big sculptures with it uh, what's great about cellu clay too is unlike a lot of other types of sculptural materials is that when it dries it's basically it's it's paper right so you can glue it to other shapes you can glue it to wood you can glue it to plastic you can glue it to metal Unlike clay, you know, when it's dry, it's really hard to glue things to it or glue it to something, right? So if you're sculpting something in clay and an arm breaks off, you can kind of, you can use like crazy glue to kind of, but it's, it's not really going to last. Like it might look okay on display or on a shelf somewhere, but it's not going to be, um something that you would want to be holding every day let's say it was in a cup or something whereas this you know you could build lots of small pieces and then stick them together uh, to build one large thing Almost all done here. Again, I'm going to pour that water that I just washed things out outside rather than down my sink or in my toilet bowl. Otherwise, it's possible that some of that stuff could stick and dry onto those surfaces and then, boy, I've got a bigger problem. Okay, so I just wanted to, I, I've been neglectful of the chat throughout the episode here, so I want to, um, wow, there's a lot of comments. Paula got her booster shot yesterday, that is awesome, Lolly and Paula. Oh, Lolly made a Facebook account so that she can post to the group. That's awesome. <laughs> I mean, I guess, part of me, I'm conflicted about Facebook. I, I, I think it's debatable how, whether it's doing good things or bad things to the world. So, But uh, it is one of the easiest ways for us to connect, right? I know there's other platforms as well, but majority of people have a Facebook, so it's, it helps us um, organize our community. Ah, and there's Maria. Hi, Maria. Nice to see you. Um, 
Well, he says, lower your expectations for my work as low as possible. Oh, I bet you they're probably much better than you think they are, for sure. Well, he likes the ones where we get a little messy. Uh, ah, Deborah says, I'm looking forward to doing this one. I already have all the materials because of the art projects that I do with my grandkids. That is cool. Got our spam bots working overtime here, posting links. To, I don't know what those links are for. Probably something that is either some kind of scam or some, something that <laughs> um, I don't want to be looking at. I want... uh, Maria watched uh, um, Nanette by Hannah Gadsby. Awesome. Thank you. That's great. I'm so glad you watched that, Maria. Hannah Gatsby is Australian stand-up comedian who did uh, a perform... One of her stand-up specials is called Nanette. And in it, she takes Pablo Picasso to task. It's, it's really great. I think um, if you haven't watched that, that would be a great Saturday evening Netflix... I think it's on Netflix um, thing to, to watch. Ah, Deborah says, I went to the City Lights bookstore in San Francisco where the famous writers and beatniks went. Yes. So, uh, did I, I didn't, I don't think I mentioned, talked about the, the beats. I meant to. Um, so City Light bookstore is just like Deborah was saying, is like ground zero for the beat generation, the beat movement. Um, so the beats, probably the most famous three or four books here we have Allen Ginsberg's Howl which is a, a, a like a long poem it's probably takes maybe about an hour to read and and there's often readings of it where people will read a page of it and pass it on um, kind of what's the famous uh, the, the sort of begins something like I've seen the greatest minds of my generation you know uh fall apart or degenerate or I can't remember how it goes. William S. Burroughs' Naked Lunch, which was made into a David Lynch film. Um, Naked Lunch is probably William S. Burroughs' most accessible book. William S. Burroughs is very famous for a technique called automatic writing, where it's about uh, just writing as quickly as possible and not editing, just dumping everything out onto the page. And then once you've got something then you can um, edit it, shape it into something. But the idea is, is just to produce and not to judge yourself. And it's a, it's, a, it's a technique a lot of writers use, especially to kind of like, it's essentially kind of like a brainstorming. But unlike brainstorming where you're just throwing ideas out there, the automatic writing is, is your, you're literally writing full, well, you don't have to write full sentences. I guess there's no real rules for it, but uh, that's how William S. Burroughs used it. Um, my very first art exhibition was a, a, a two-person show with William S. Burroughs. That was a long time ago, but uh, that's one of my proudest achievements as an artist. A um, uh, little fun fact, that, that'll be in the trivia card long after I'm dead. Jack Kerouac's On the Road is an excellent book. Uh, that book changed my life. Jack Kerouac's On the Road. If you haven't read it, it's I highly recommend it. It's usually sort of considered to be one of the top 50 books in American history. Um, it's, it's essentially about this guy who goes on a... He's sort of like a drifter. It's, it's from the... I think it's a first person. It's it's basically sort of like a journal of Jack Kerouac uh, when he's maybe 25 years old, traveling back and forth across the United States, hitchhiking. Uh, he's got his girlfriend with him, or I think his wife, and he he meets up with who be the the guy that becomes his best friend along the way, and uh, Neil Cassidy who's another um, 
who, who's sort of like the prototypical beat fellow, although wasn't very productive as a writer himself, but is like um, him and him and Jack Kerouac were best friends. Great, great book. I remember being super excited after I read that book. It changed my life. I got super excited about just the idea of traveling and, and life as art. I did reread it about five or six years ago and found it to be kind of depressing. <laughs> um, because it's sort of like these guys are going through this existential crisis as to like, what is life about? Like, what am I doing? Who am I? Um... You know, it's 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 you know it's it's a coming of age story at its essence, and um, and some of the you know they're they I think they get robbed and beat up, and there's lots of drinking and fist fights and all sorts of things. You can imagine why a twenty year old and I I think I was eighteen years old when I read that book. Why would it appeal to me? It's not really considered to be. You know, uh, probably very popular among women or young women. It's more of like a young man's book, I'm sure. Uh, but those are the, if you wanted to to read any three of those books, Naked Lunch is definitely a pretty weird book. Um, as 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 much of William S. S. Burroughs' books as uh, he also William S. Burroughs is also very famous for another writing technique called a, the cut up method, where literally going through the newspaper and cutting words and sentences out of the newspaper, throwing them on the floor and then rearranging them and uh, not even particular, some, there's different ways to do it, some is we're trying to arrange them purposefully, sometimes you just let it be really weird and then, I'm trying to remember he did a book using that technique, I think there's a little bit of that in Naked Lunch um let me see. So really, there's you, you can see the, the, the two main places are New York and San Francisco. And obviously, Jay DeFeo is a San Francisco artist. Uh, and she is really the most well-known artist directly associated with the beat movement. There are other visual artists who are who have sort of been um, kind of included or associated with that movement, the abstract expressionists being probably the primary group here. Uh, so people like Jackson Pollock and Willem de Kooning and Robert Motherwell, all those guys, but I don't really know if they ever interacted with Jack Kerouac or uh, William S. Burroughs, maybe, maybe Burroughs and Ginsburg, but I don't... Kerouac doesn't strike me as... He did his own drawings, but I don't think he was... There, there was much intersection there. Um, let's see, another thing here. So it mentions like Hans Hoffman, Philip Guston, who we looked at. You know, Guston's early paintings before he did the more cartoony images that we did when we did our two paintings on Guston. It was kind of a, vaguely associated with the, the Beat Generation. Um... Lots of other links and lots of other stuff I could talk about here. But I, San Francisco, if you go to San Francisco, you definitely got to go to City City Lights. Ah! Right. Um, the, it's a great bookstore. If, you're, if you can't find any books on any of the Beat Poets, City Lights will have it for sure. And they also do lots of readings, uh, book signings and stuff. Very famous little bookstore in San Francisco. Um, so there's City Lights right next to the Coit Tower area. So this whole area was kind of ground zero for the... Um, the beat generation, because at that time it was a, it was you know it was right by the wharfs. You know, it's a, it was a, a working class neighborhood. Now, and here's the San Francisco Museum of Art. Now that area is is like some of the most expensive houses in the United States, right? San Francisco is a very expensive city nowadays. Um,
Let me see. Uh, Marie used air dry clay for today's project. That is cool. I'd be really interested in seeing how that turns out. Lolly had never seen the cellu clay before. Um, that's great. That we. I'm sure you should be able to buy that in in uh, England. Because uh, that, that's where you are, right? I, so that should be feasible there. Um, it might not be the same brand, but I'm sure. You know, it's it's just it's like paper mache or instant paper mache, as it might be known. Oh, Deborah lost power. Ay, ay, in Quebec. I bet you there's a lot of snow where you are, Deborah. I hope you're okay. It's terribly windy out. I won't be here long. Heidi says there is paper pulp clay dough that uh, some open studios use in China for kids to do sculptures with. Moisturized, pre-colored, kept in sealed containers, lightweight, and they're not as messy as clay. Wow, so many... So many comments here, I'm just trying to skip through because in case there's a question anybody has. <laughs> Versus, what about stuff called alien tape? I'm not sure alien tape. Is that like a gauze? Like a plaster bandage of some kind? Let's, uh... Let's look up alien tape. As seen on TV. Oh, it's like you could stick it to different things. Interesting. Cool. There's a little free advertising for alien tape. I haven't... Versus I have a thing for late night infomercials. <laughs> um, awesome. Cool. Well, thank you everyone for painting or did a little bit of painting today, I suppose. On Tuesday, we're going to be look. We're going to be painting a Christmas tree since Christmas is coming up, and I thought I would do some of the Christmas stuff prior to Christmas so that people aren't just furiously painting a Christmas tree on the day of Christmas and then have to put it away. So we'll do our Christmas tree a little bit before uh, Christmas this year, um, and. Yeah, I'm going to post a question on the Facebook group just for people um, because I'm getting ready to do our our first few episodes redoing the intro to painting class again. So uh, after this episode goes, I'm going to post that question there and I'd be very interested to hear some of your responses to that question around art supplies and what supplies you would recommend that maybe I've forgotten to recommend so that I can include them in that video which I'm going to film in the next few days. So... Otherwise, thanks everyone for watching, for making art. Please take a picture, upload it to the Facebook group so I can see it. I think next weekend we're going to do an episode where we look at all the great artwork you've made. So get those photos up there so that I can give you some feedback and give you some congratulations because I'm sure it is in order and you're due for some congratulations for all the incredible work that you've been working on, right? Anybody who's making art is doing the world a service as far as I'm concerned. Uh, there's a PayPal link if you want to leave a donation. You can use the Super Chat here in YouTube. If you want to send a check or e-transfer, contact me through the Facebook group or my emails on my website. Otherwise, we'll see you guys on Tuesday. If it's cold and rainy where you are, that's the case where I am for sure. Try to stay warm. Making a painting is a good way of keeping yourself warm. So check out some of the older videos. 
We'll see you guys in a few days. Good night, everybody.